Hello everyone, welcome to the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group Multiscale Modeling Consortium webinar series and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Iwana Yasiak um, to introduce the speaker from the IMU Beam Working Group. Thank you. Iwana, go ahead please. Thank you, Grace. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sinan Kitten, who is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering and mechanical engineering at Northwestern University. Uh, he joined Northwestern University uh, faculty in 2010 after obtaining P his PhD um, at MIT. Uh, his research expertise lies in computational material science and mechanics with an emphasis on biological and bio-inspired systems. He has uh, made or original contributions to elucidating structure property relationships in biological materials, such as spider silk, silk and others. His most notable um, contributions have involved theoretical calculations and multi-scale simulations that have explained how biological nanostructural materials achieve strength and toughness through important molecular level size and geometric effects. He has published over 40 uh, articles in journals such as Nature, Materials, PNAS, and Nanoletters, uh, and have been cited over a thousand times. Um, he is currently uh, serves as principal investigator for research projects funded by the National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research, and Army Research Office. Uh, he has given numerous invited lectures and keynotes around the world. And Dr. Kitten is also actively involved in creating new web-based educational tools that facilitate training of students and researchers in mechanics, materials, and computational engineering. It's great. It's our great pleasure, Sinan, to uh, have you as uh, today's speaker. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ivana. It's uh, really my pleasure to uh, give this talk today. Um, I'm going to put my slides on the full screen. Hopefully, everyone can see it. Um, can everyone see it? The slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, the title of my talk is Tuning the Entropic Spring to Dictate Order and Functionality in Polymer Conjugated Peptide uh, Biomaterials. And uh, there's a lot of words there, so I will. Uh, explain point by point starting from the end of the title all the way to the beginning of the title. So first I'll talk about polymer conjugated peptide biomaterials, um, then go into a little bit more how we can use computational tools to understand their ordering and functionality, and then finally look at uh, some concepts related to the entropy of uh, polymer chain attachment, and finally um, aspects that go beyond entropic elasticity and uh, go towards more enthalpic uh, contributions. And um, this is uh, a lot of the work we've done over the past couple of years uh, at Northwestern University in my research group. And the, the basic idea is that uh, we, we have a good sense of how polymers uh, work and uh, we can control the phase behavior of these systems. We can utilize the relatively simple uh, chemistry of the building blocks to come up with uh, different types of functional materials, thin films, nanofibers, and so forth. Um, and particularly the, the scalability, uh, the cheap nature and processability of these building blocks is, is really important for many applications and has been a field of research for many years. Um, they're also robust compared to some of the more fragile biological systems, although there has been a lot of interest in looking at biological uh, protein-based materials uh, to come up with uh, strength and toughness mechanisms for uh, macromolecular systems. Uh, so there's been a lot of groups that have uh, worked on polymers and also in biological systems, but more recently there's been a lot of emphasis on looking at the best properties of uh, both systems and how those can be combined in what we call conjugate uh, systems. So where the polymer domain and the peptide domain in, in a material are covalently linked to each other to come up with uh, new materials. Um, so, so those materials blend the, the capabilities we have with polymers, uh, with the unique aspects of proteins, uh, specifically biocompatibility, different types of functionalities that are unique to proteins, or that proteins are extremely efficient in, their three-dimensional topologies, and also the universal uh, hydrogen bonding and other interactions um, that make proteins unique 
in terms of structure and uh, performance. Um, so this is a sort of the domain area of interest uh, of the computations I will uh, present today. Um, so there's a lot of interest in combining these two advantages uh, of these two domains particularly improved stability, controlled assembly, and uh, tailored functionalities in engineered systems are what we are after. In a way, uh, one can think of this as a, a sort of analogous to what people have accomplished recently with uh, DNA nanotechnologies and colloidal systems, where by utilizing the, the specificity of uh, DNA and the colloidal assembly mechanisms, uh, there has been a lot of new functional materials that have come to fruition in the past decade or so. Um, the idea is to re reproduce some of those capabilities in uh, peptide-based systems and utilize what the peptides are as functionality. Um, the originality of the work, of course, is that um, this uh, interface between peptides and polymers is kind of a new frontier. And we don't have a general materials by design approach to come up with those uh, soft materials. So in the context of this you know, broader picture, I'm focusing on two different systems today. One is uh, what we call polymer-wrapped peptide nanotubes, which can be grown in block copolymer domains in polymer thin films to make nanoporous uh, materials. And these can be seen as artificial transmembrane uh, channels, just like the transmembrane proteins but in a much simplified uh, fashion. And uh, these are typically used for separations applications, so separating ions from water or uh, different types of gas molecules and so forth. The second uh, part of the talk will focus on uh, polymer-wrapped coiled coils, uh, which are often used as drug delivery vehicles and have found applications in um, hydrogels as well. So this work is in collaboration with Ting Shu's group. Uh, she's at the University of California, Berkeley. Her expertise is in, in, in a broad run number of fields, uh, most notably peptide polymer uh, hybrid materials uh, experimentally, and our work is more on the computational side. There's a lot of interest uh, in the field in looking at uh, self-assembly behavior of these systems, so fundamental questions as to how uh, conjugated polymers uh, change the self-assembly behavior of peptides and vice versa. Uh, applications range from non-biological to biomedical, uh, tissue engineering, drug delivery, separation, and so forth. And a lot of the work we do with computations goes into more of the fundamental science part of things where uh, we're interested in understanding what polymer conjugation does to peptides, how peptide uh, chemistry influences the behavior of the polymers, and these interactions between the components, um, how that can be utilized. The, the challenge that my group typically deals with, that, with is that uh, the, the process to discovery is fairly long for these complicated uh, soft materials. They're really at their infancy at this point. And um, this is also recognized by the Obama administration in 2011. Um, the Materials Genome Initiative was uh, launched and uh, this uh, initiative generally tries to address some of the difficulties in uh, accelerating materials discovery. In particular, uh, the, the desire is to make materials two times faster, two times cheaper by utilizing databases, computational tools, and experimental uh, techniques. So that's something we want to achieve, and uh, uh, Northwestern University recently uh, launched this uh, Center for Hierarchical Materials Design which, is, uh, which has become one of the premier centers for this materials genome initiative. And uh, we're involved with a lot of the activities there, and some of the work I'll present today is uh, broadly related to uh, some of the advances in, in this area. So the question is, of course, how do we accelerate materials discovery? And materials by design, which is using uh, computation and theory, uh, becomes a very important tool uh, for this process. In particular, if we look at the materials discovery continuum, uh, the, the first three steps, discovery, development, and optimization, is the most uh, time-consuming and costly part of it, particularly looking at peptide and polymeric systems. And of course, naturally, one thinks of resorting to computational tools because computers are made to iterate. They're cheap and they're also scalable. So a problem that we cannot solve with a single computer could presumably be solved in a supercomputing system uh, as long as the problem is scalable on its own. Um, the difficulty, of course, for soft materials is that uh, establishing uh, uh, reliable methods to study the, uh, that could be useful for materials discovery is kind of challenging. So 
that's something what we try to that we try to uh, accomplish in our group, uh, which is to establish simulation uh, tools for materials discovery. So a number of tools have been uh, recently developed uh, for studying soft materials. Atomistic modeling involves uh, solving uh, Newton's equations of motion for a system of particles where each particle uh, represents an atom. Coarse grain modeling is a, is a technique where these atomic interactions are uh, scaled to reduced order systems where now instead of modeling every single atom, we look at clusters of atoms and simplified effective potentials between the atoms. Uh, this is similar to what we do with structural engineering and mechanical engineering and many other fields where uh, lumped bead mass spring models uh, uh, can be useful in describing some of the features in these systems. Um, and for soft materials, we do have these established tools, including atomistic and uh, mean field approaches, uh, continuum models, for example. But the difficulty really lies in these mesoscopic scales where um, particularly for soft materials, the complexity of the structures and the, the uh, intrinsic uh, 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 hierarchies in the materials make it very difficult for us to use a single method to describe all of the features. So retaining chemistry and understanding the scales is, is what we are after in many applications. Um, in this talk, I won't talk too much about uh, the techniques we've developed or uh, the different types of algorithms that are commonly used. Uh, but I'll give brief examples of uh, where we've used uh, coarse graining uh, in the past and we've made uh, new discoveries um, in terms of um, materials behavior. So uh, we've applied uh, coarse graining techniques to graphene or uh, crystalline uh, materials uh, in the past where we can study uh, large-scale nano indentation test, uh, fracture, anisotropy, and multilayer uh, shear behavior of these graphene systems. Um, in the past, we've come up with methods, uh, hybrid methods that involve atomistic simulations combined with experimental data to develop thin film materials uh, for polymeric systems. Uh, this was also uh, published recently for methacrylates and other systems. And uh, the, the primary focus of this talk will be the works on uh, polymer peptide conjugates, which are really uh, uh, focused on these uh, hybrid interfaces. The bottom line with coarse graining is that uh, you can speed up the simulations by roughly three orders of magnitude and yet retain uh, a selective number of properties um, uh, that or quantities of interest that could be reproduced with the same simulations. Now, if we look at it from a, a student's perspective, of course, uh, a simulation that takes one day as opposed to three years uh, makes a big difference. And uh, this is, of course, a very useful tool uh, in that sense. It really accelerates uh, the the time to graduation for PhD students and uh, of course uh, allows new types of science uh, that could be carried out. Sinan, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes, sure. Uh, we're not projecting your PowerPoint on the screen. Did you stop sharing? Um, I didn't, but uh, did it stop at this point or? Uh, uh, just a few, just now? a minute before, yeah. I see. Uh, let's see. It seems like we're sharing your other screen that has the video on it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, let me try something else. Let me stop sharing and... Uh, and we can cut this out of the recording, so it's okay. Okay. Okay, you can, we can see it now. Right. If I make it full screen, I don't know if it's going to be any larger, but uh, hopefully you can see the slides. Um, so if you make it full screen and share the screen, is that what you did last time? That's what I was doing. I don't know why I switched to the other screen. Oh. The... Should I do that instead? So if I do, is this better? Nope, is also sharing her screen right now. Who is? Sylvia Spengler. Oh, this, I. This is good. Um, Sylvia, can you see this? No, not yet. No, not yet. The problem is that she is sharing her screen right now. Oh. She well, I didn't plan to. <laughs> well, well, right now, so all I did is all I. I mean. I okay. get grace when when I stop viewing. I, I'm all I'm doing is viewing share. So how did I share my screen? 
Okay, I think you're fine now, but you can't see um, the PowerPoint, can you? No. Hmm. It's okay. I'm I, I'm the only one. I'll just I'll just listen. Okay. All right, you can go ahead, Sinan. I okay, think we're yeah. okay. If at any point the slides disappear, please let me know and I'll uh, redo this. I think it, it'll give priority to me if I just uh, start sharing again. So uh, there's a number of computational frameworks we're using right now. Most of the studies involve all, all atomistic MD simulations. Um, these are usually intensive calculations. Uh, sampling issues are, uh, are common, but uh, it's really a good technique for understanding proteins and polymers and a uh, new approach to studying designer hybrid materials. Many advanced uh, sampling techniques are used to accelerate what you cannot see with MD simulations and obtain free energy landscapes. Uh, so this is also key for bridging skills, but accuracy depends on the technique and how it's implemented. And the third step, of course, is the coarse grain MD simulations, which are uh, have a lot of different uh, advantages and also disadvantages in terms of uh, detail in uh, loss of detail, parameterization, and the qualitative nature of these uh, methods. But this, these are all useful techniques that I'll present that uh, enable features uh, related to materials by design. So going into the applications, I'll first talk about the, the membranes for separations. Um, the applications we picked for this were more related to desalination and other non-biological uh, applications, but one can clearly see that there's going to be relevance for um, dialysis and uh, artificial membrane systems that could also find a number of biological applications. So the idea with existing uh, membranes is that you're trying to separate uh, two or more different types of fluids um, using some kind of a nanoporous system. The pore sizes typically are polydispersed and can be fairly large, and there's a trade-off between permeability and selectivity in, in typical systems. So to overcome some of the limitations with polymeric membranes, there's been a lot of growing interest in uh, polymer composite membranes, where you could have nanotubes or other types of building blocks embedded in the polymer domains to give you a little bit more structural control over the pores. And uh, the difficulty there is, of course, the uh, interior functionalization of these pores is uh, fairly difficult with carbon nanotubes and other types of systems, and especially while uh, retaining uh, sub-nanometer size pores, which is usually uh, useful for many separations. So when you look at biological systems, on the other hand, uh, this is really the core principle of water channels and ion channels found in our cells. And uh, insertion of nonpolar and bulky functional groups to the interior of the channels allows for things like size exclusion, uh, which can drive ions out of the uh, channels and uh, not allow them to pass. And polar and charged functional groups can also control water and ion orientation and coordination in the sub-nanometer pores. So clearly, achieving some kind of chemical diversity within the pores is sort of a central idea uh, that we see in, uh, in membrane technologies, but is really limited in terms of uh, what we can do currently. To address this issue, uh, uh, Ting's group and my group have, over the past few years, uh, been working on a new type of uh, system which uh, involves uh, cyclopeptide nanotubes. These are uh, ring-shaped peptides, uh, small molecules, uh, based on protein uh, type of sequences, uh, that uh, can assemble into tubular structures uh, through hydrogen bonding. Uh, so just like how self-assembling peptides work, and you can conjugate them with polymers to grow them in polymer thin films where they will uh, have uh, favorable interfacial interactions with block of polymer domains, cylindrical domains, and start growing within the film in solution processing. So this way you can make nanoporous films, you can test them for gas separation or other applications. Um, furthermore, you can functionalize the interior of these tubes with single amino acid uh, mutations uh, to the ring sequence. And, uh, this way you can have polar or nonpolar interiors which can be uh, mimicking, used for mimicking biological channels. Now this was very interesting to us uh, to study computationally um, and also it's sort of a nice tool, uh, nice area to research from a computational perspective because the chemical mutations are very challenging. Each one takes a couple of years to synthesize but they're relatively easy to build and test uh, in silico in computational methods. So this is a movie, I hope it shows properly on the screen, uh, that shows the growth of peptide nanotubes in, in simulation. This is a coarse grain modeling approach we developed 
uh, which takes into account free energies of binding between the peptide rings and uh, simulates it at larger length scales in implicit solvent. Uh, what you can see here is that the nanotubes first grow by dimerization, uh, where uh, small duplets uh, form. And then the duplets come together to form tetramers, and then tetramers come to form together to form a, a larger assembly. So this is what's called a self-similar coarsening in, in uh, the physics literature. It's similar to step Palmer growth. And it's a very efficient way the nanotubes grow in solution and also can grow in membranes. So, uh, the simulations kind of helped us understand the kinetics of this growth process, revealing how fast uh, the growth is and how the early steps of binding uh, really govern the behavior of the systems as a whole. So the objective is to understand these growth mechanisms of the, the nanotubes, uh, look at functionalization of the interiors from a transport perspective, and also come up with designs for efficient membranes that could be used for a broad range of applications. The key question is how to achieve high flux and high selectivity in a nanopore. I mean, that's uh, really what all boils down to. And for this purpose, we look at biological amino acids that have functional groups that are known to be playing a huge role in selectivity in transport in water and ion channels. Uh, the case study here is a more water desalination, which is generalized uh, uh, term for separating ions from water uh, and also other uh, uh, things that could be in solution. So we looked at sodium and chloride ions and uh, water as a mixture uh, example. Now the question, of course, is uh, that uh, is it really possible to come up with membranes that can have uh, these uh, very appealing features that we see in biological systems? And many people think this is quite difficult, if not impossible, because uh, the first aspect is that tuning the pore size and interior polarity is a sort of a challenge, and uh, how that leads to new transport capabilities is relatively unknown. The second issue is that uh, polymer conjugation is, is really complicated physics for uh, these systems, and uh, understanding that is uh, not very easy. And the third aspect is even if you understand how polymer conjugation and how transport works, could you really come up with uh, um, uh, dictated ordering in these peptide nanotubes such that you could control their stacking order and make interior functionalizations that are spatially uh, tunable. So these are the three challenges we were interested in solving. So we carried out with the transport problem, uh, which uh, is uh, looking at how water and ion molecules pass through these nanotubes. Um, the movie uh, that's on the screen shows uh, a highlighted yellow water molecule uh, passing through the peptide nanotube, where you can see the individual rings. And uh, you can also see the functional groups pointing at the bottom of the nanotube into the interior. So clearly the functional groups interact with water through hydrogen bonding and other electrostatic interactions. And tuning those interactions changes the way the transport happens. So this is more like a hopping mechanism rather than you know, macroscopic continuum flow uh, that you would typically see in larger contents. So understanding these hopping mechanisms becomes um, key to describing some of the transport features. So in the next slide, we looked at uh, different types of uh, functional groups that could be inserted, uh, something inspired from glycine, another polar group inspired from lysine, and alanine, which is more of a nonpolar uh, bulky group. So nonpolar groups clearly reduce the flux, whereas polar groups increase the flux, and uh, there's an inverse correlation with the size of the pore uh, of the flux. And uh, we found that there's a physical metric governing the, which, which we can call the molecular roughness of the energy landscape of the pores, which relates to the transport uh, in, a, in sort of a very uh, clear way, where one can create uh, smoother landscapes for this transport phenomena, which can increase the flux. And uh, the kind of mutations that give you smoother landscapes can be quantified and put into this sort of mean field viewpoint of how flux can be governed with chemical mutations. So clearly the glycine is the, the best transporter because it has a smooth landscape, whereas glyc uh, alanine uh, gives rise to energy barriers that slow down the process of uh, transport. The, the difference, of course, here is that uh, compared to macroscopic flows, um, the uh, size and flux are not always correlated. The size of a, a nanopore can be measured by the number of molecules in the pores, and we find that uh, even though two pores may accommodate the same number of water molecules in, e in equilibrium, 
um, the way they transport the molecules is not just dependent on occupancy. Uh, so here, if you look at glycine and lysine on the left-hand side figure, they have very similar uh, occupancy values, but the flux is uh, three or four times higher for glycine. And uh, similar things can be seen with efficiency or the directionality of the transport where roughness can, even though it's bad for flux, may actually rectify the transport by allowing backflow to ha happen uh, with a less frequency as well. So these were some of the things that we saw at the molecular level that uh, give, gave us new insights into the um, flux behavior of water molecules in these systems. Additionally, we understood uh, various aspects of ion transport in these systems through molecular dynamic simulations. And in particular, the, the coordination of the ions uh, and uh, the influence of functional groups uh, has a huge effect on the transport metrics. So on the lower right-hand side, the yellow bars uh, show uh, how fast ions transport through these nanopores as well. And one can see that um, small functional groups that uh, don't interact strong, strongly with the um, tubular structure give rise to high transport rates. And polar groups uh, uh, or nonpolar groups uh, essentially push the ions towards the walls where uh, the ion starts looking for carbonyl groups where it can bind strongly. And that uh, directly increases the rejection rate and also the energetics of transport. So uh, less favorable transport can occur in those cases. So just single point mutations in the pore are adequate enough to uh, have very large differences in the flux uh, rates. Uh, so looking at these different functional groups uh, gave us a lot of ideas on that, biomimetic uh, groups in particular. So from this, of course, it becomes evident that um, perhaps if we could combine these different functional groups, say something that is polar with something that's relatively nonpolar, we could perhaps come up with pores that blend the best aspects. So uh, perhaps um, um, tunability or selectivity uh, with flux in these nanopore systems, uh, which is usually uh, go hand in hand, and they're inverse. I think there's some uh, feedback from someone the microphone. Yeah. I, I see myself there. I... Yeah. OK, thank you. So uh, the idea now is how do you blend flux and selectivity in these nanopore systems, uh, and how could you achieve chemical diversity in these systems? So if you look at all of the uh, nanoscale transport uh, studies and nanoscale uh, self-assembly studies, tuning the binding energy between these building blocks is sort of the key. And that requires increasing the specificity of the system. But that also leads to kinetic traps in, in the self-assembly process. So that's also uh, not usually a good thing uh, to have. So in essence, what we try to do here is uh, to uh, look at uh, polymer conjugation to promote ordering in these uh, nanostructure systems. In particular, we are interested in looking at uh, uh, using polymer conjugation to promote uh, ordering uh, in these uh, self-assembled systems. So essentially control the self-assembly and thus the stacking sequence by attaching polymers to these peptide rings. Uh, can everyone hear me well currently? Yes, you are fine. Okay, great. Yeah, I, 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 was, I just wanted to make sure. So. Um, the, the idea here is that uh, the peptide rings that want to self-assemble due to hydrogen bonding, which is fairly strong, and uh, the polymer arms get squished in this confined state. And uh, during this process, they are going to push each other due to the uh, entropic uh, elasticity of the polymer chains and their excluded volumes. So this gives us a way to tune the self-assembly behavior of peptides by using polymers as a general uh, framework um, that doesn't involve the ent ent entalpic or specific interactions. So here, uh, by changing the number of arms attached to these uh, self-assembling peptides and changing the length of the arms, you can actually tune the self-assembly likelihood of different systems. So this is something we want to play around uh, theoretically. And uh, we came up with ideas to uh, basically quantify uh, some, or come up with scaling relationships that describe this effect. Uh, which comes from bottle brush polymers. So one can get a sense of how the free energy will vary uh, with uh, different types of uh, parameters that you can have in the system. The difficulty, of course, is uh, the scaling relationships don't give you exact free energy penalties. So this is, again, uh, a situation where coarse grain models came in to be useful. 
And what we did was to build these uh, nanotubular uh, systems with uh, purely excluded volume interactions in the polymer chains and enthalpic interactions in the core. And look at the, the time of uh, breaking of the nanotube under high temperatures uh, where the entropic forces become large. So from the time uh, of survival of the nanotubes, you can get the free energies. And comparing the free energies, you can get a sense of the self-assembly mechanisms. So then the question became, uh, by looking at this polymer conjugation effect, could you create uh, mixed nanotubes with controlled uh, sequential order? And uh, we found that the uh, free energies of the systems become more favorable if uh, you mix two different types of building blocks where one uh, building block has a large degree of conjugation and the other has a relatively low degree of conjugation. In such systems, it becomes more favorable to for the system to intermingle these two building blocks because it releases the confinement penalty uh, that emerges from the other peptide uh, building blocks. So uh, utilizing atomistic simulations combined with coarse grain simulations, we quantify these free energy penalties and uh, basically propose that this partial confinement release upon mixing decreases the entropic penalty of assembly and alternating mix sequences should be favorable when the difference in the degree of conjugation is very high. So with this information, you can uh, develop these phase diagrams for predicting the order anywhere from alternating sequences to completely segregated sequences, which could give us a way of tuning the interior of the nanotubes uh, by using self-assembly principles that are very general. So it doesn't depend on the chemistry of the peptide. It only depends on the uh, parameters of excluded volumes, which are the length and number of chains attached to the system. So it's a very general useful approach to uh, guiding self-assembly. Now, the question, of course, how do you validate all of this uh, theoretical advances? And uh, it's really difficult uh, to, to really look at sequences in experiment, but you can get uh, indirect information from uh, imaging as well as uh, growth mechanisms uh, that you can observe uh, in solution or uh, by depositing on the surfaces. So uh, Ting's group looked at uh, two-arm and four-arm mixtures in toluene and uh, they found that the, the forearms uh, really don't grow as much as two arms. Uh, these can grow up to 300 nanometers in size, macroscopic tubular uh, systems almost. And uh, forearms are limited to a few nanometers. And when you mix them, your length distribution is somewhere in between. So that automatically suggests that there's some kind of mixtures because you don't see a bimodal distribution and uh, you see the longer nanotubes being capped or being shortened due to this mixing. So we don't know exactly what the sequences are, but we can get a sense of uh, uh, what's going to happen. So we used uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations to perhaps get a sense of how the sequence would be controlled by these uh, features. And uh, the issue with MD, of course, is that uh, uh, your systems are typically kinetically trapped. So as the peptides want to grow, they attach to the first monomer they see around them. And as a result, regardless of how you change the interfacial binding energies with polymer conjugation, for example, you always get randomly at at assigned uh, systems and you cannot control the chemical diversity in the system in a spatial manner. Whereas on the other hand, if you have simulated the annealing or replica exchange simulations, your sa sampling is much better and you can predict the phase diagram in thermodynamic equilibrium as well as non-equilibrium conditions. And uh, this has a lot to do with the mechanics of the tubes and how they fragment and how they self-correct themselves during this process. So this opened up a lot of new questions as to how to control both kinetics and thermodynamics to um, control the structural ordering of peptides using polymer conjugation as a principle. So this is something we're uh, working on further. So in summary of the first part, uh, we came up with ways to understand the transport uh, from molecular simulations. We found that co polymer conjugation can be really useful as a general principle to uh, dictate ordering. And we found that the ordering can be uh, controlled by kinetic and thermodynamic factors that can also be reproduced in experimental conditions. So now we haven't really created membrane systems that have the chemical diversity that is seen in biology. But uh, we're getting there in terms of the theoretical tools, uh, materials design techniques, and uh, also the experiments that are going hand in hand with these. Looking ahead, uh, we're also looking at different implications for separations. So uh, some of the health-related applications of these systems include uh, detecting aquatic metals uh, in, in uh, water and other systems where 
um, toxicity and so forth is directly related to the presence of the uh, metal ions uh, and uh, understanding the relative ratios of metal ions in a, in a mixed solution was, would be very useful. So for these purposes, we look at ion uh, rejection index and water permeation index. Um, we can come up with different types of peptide chemistries uh, that give us uh, uh, sort of these materials design rules um, that could be used for multiple applications. So if uh, ion rejection is preferred, you could use these systems for desalination. Uh, if ion permeation is preferred, then you could use these for antibacterial applications or uh, specific ion transport in membrane systems, which has a lot of biological and biomedical applications in general. So in the long run, we want to, of course, replicate this chemical diversity in biology to really create uh, membranes by design. So that was the first part of my talk, which focused uh, primarily on using entropic uh, elasticity of the polymer arms to come up with uh, highly ordered structural systems. Uh, now, there's a lot of interest in utilizing. Hello? Any question? OK. Um, so uh, the, the second part of my talk will uh, look at a secondary system where we can come up with coil-coil uh, -coil assemblies, uh, which are a different type of peptide system that are also wrapped in polymers. And this can give rise to different types of uh, hierarchical systems that have intriguing uh, physical properties. So coiled coils are alpha helical assemblies that are very commonly found in biology. Uh, Ting's group has uh, came up with a system of uh, conjugations uh, of uh, polyethylene glycol chains, PEG chains, um, that can give rise to di different types of directed ordered structures, such as micelles and, um, and other systems. So in this case, the, the polyethylene glycol serves as kind of a spacer um, that has a certain excluded volume that can actually dictate the geometry of the system. It can also give rise to directional forces, as in the case of the peptide assembly. And the factors governing uh, the enthalpic interactions in coiled coils are mostly hydrophobic interactions in the core, along with ionic interactions in the exterior of the, um, uh, the, the coiled coils. So there's been a lot of experimental efforts in designing these new uh, systems. Uh, Ting's group has made a lot of uh, advances in this area. They, they found that, for example, uh, conjugating polymers to the end, which is the most typical way of polymer conjugation, usually leads to destabilization of the peptides, whereas if you conjugate them on the sides, you can utilize polymer, uh, polymer features to, to guide different aspects of uh, um, assembly. And this is, again, going back to the idea of entropic springs. Uh, we've also carried out some computational uh, experiments with coarse grain models where we study uh, polymer chain conformations, conjugation effects on aggregation, uh, looking at end and side conjugation, and also different types of complica complication mechanisms in these systems. Um, the conclusion from all of these was that uh, excluded volume of PEG controls the hierarchical assemblies, and just like in the case of the peptide nanotubes, can be a very useful tool for dictated uh, uh, directional self-assembly. Um, and the fundamental question that this leads to, uh, of course, is uh, we've only focused on excluded volume effects, which are fairly simple to simulate and uh, easy to theoretically describe to some extent. But can we go beyond this purely entropic idea and utilize polymer conjugation to stabilize uh, proteins in different ways? So then two questions come up at these interfaces. One is, can polymer conjugation influence protein stability? So in a way, it'd be used to improve protein uh, interactions with thermal and uh, mechanical insults. And also, can polymer conjugation uh, conformation be altered by the peptide sequence as well? So can we use the peptides to template different configurations of polymers, um, both homopolymers as well as block copolymers and other systems? So here, uh, uh, I'd like to discuss the basic features of coiled coils uh, really quickly. Um, there's been many studies looking at the uh, stability of coiled coils. Um, Marcus Bueller's group, along with others, have looked at it computationally. There's been a lot of experiments as well. But the key idea is that uh, helix unfolding occurs uh, in, uh, through the rupture of hydrogen bonds, and then coiled coils can also unzip through the loss of hydrophobic contacts. Uh, one mm -hmm. question that sort of remains open is which one is more likely to happen, and uh, what are the energetics of the, these different events? 
So uh, we've recently looked at uh, steer molecular dynamics simulations to see how a coiled coil uh, would uh, unfold under mechanical influences. And it became clear that uh, for the system to unzip and separate, or basically disassemble, one usually has to denature the coils uh, or the helices first, and then they can more easily lose their hydrophobic contact. So uh, unfolding is essentially a, a precursor to unzipping of the coiled coils. And uh, this can be done uh, also with uh, different types of energetic calculations, such as metadynamics, that can give you the sequential events during the unzipping and also unfolding. And there's uh, clearly a coupling between these two. What we found was that uh, the, this coupling can be described by two-dimensional energy landscapes uh, that you can obtain from metadynamics. So you can have two reaction coordinates, one uh, governing the unfolding of each individual helix, and also another one that governs the unzipping or separation of the helices from each other. And uh, you can uh, draw this two-dimensional landscape to understand um, various pathways through which uh, this destabilization can occur. So these were useful information uh, for understanding, uh, for instance, whether a partially unfolded protein can uh, unzip more easily or not. And indeed, uh, when you look at the free energies of these unfolding events, one can clearly see that um, unfolded uh, helices actually unzip or basically disassemble more easily than those that are uh, uh, that are trying to uh, disassemble in the intact state. So this precursor idea became a, a sort of an interesting uh, thing to build upon. So clearly anything that stabilizes the helices uh, will also have a preferential uh, benefit for coiled coil assemblies as well from a thermal standpoint. And this was also uh, validated by experiments which also showed that um, the melting temperature of uh, coiled coils can be uh, uh, stabilized uh, further by conjugation of polymers uh, to these systems. So then the question is, uh, how does polymer conjugation affect uh, peptide stability? And uh, even though there were a lot of studies that hinted towards this, there's the mechanism through which that stabilization occurs uh, was not clear. So we studied uh, using all atomistic simulations, the uh, interactions between the polyethylene glycol and peptide surfaces, and we found that the fractional helicity, uh, which is a measure of the stability of the helices, uh, grows as you increase the molecular weight of the attached polymers. And in particular, you see a direct correlation with the solvent accessible surface area of the peptides. This means that the PEG stabilizes the helix structure by reducing uh, the interactions with the water surrounding the um, the individual helices themselves. So um, this was quite interesting and uh, uh, could be explained by molecular simulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, later we found that also the conformations of the uh, polymer chains are influenced to some extent by uh, the presence of the helix near them. So typically an ideal polymeric chain will have a scaling of uh, 0.5 or higher in, in solution. Uh, with the molecular weight and the presence of the helix uh, sort of lowered the scaling where the favorable interactions with the surface uh, allowed the, the, coil, the polymers to have a more coiled uh, configuration. So uh, there's clearly effects on both sides. The polymer affects the peptides and then the peptide also affects the polymers in, in, a, uh, in this exchange. And uh, the sequence of the peptide turns out to have an important role on the uh, conformation of the polymers as well. Um, charged residues such as lysine seem to uh, involve uh, polyethylene glycol monomers uh, to reside very close to the peptide surface. And uh, the same also goes for some of the more hydrophobic uh, residues um, where uh, the polyethylene glycol has hydrophobic regions that also like to uh, sit on the surface of the peptide. So clearly uh, a number of different strategies could be implemented sequence-wise to control where the polymer resides uh, in relation to the uh, helical uh, axes. So finally, uh, I think I'm going to run out of time soon, so I'd like to wrap up uh, with uh, this final idea that we're uh, playing on a little bit. Um, this goes beyond, again, uh, the idea of just using entropy to guide assemblies, but to look at what can we do with polymer conjugation uh, to improve the stability of peptides. In particular, does everything that we see um, for thermal stabilization really apply also to mechanical stabilization of these systems 
as well. So it can peg serve as a mechanical reinforcement for peptidic systems. Um, the inspiration for this work comes from uh, recent studies on peptide polymer hydrogels, which have found applications in tissue engineering and drug delivery. So hydrogels with fibrin as an extensible crosslink have been developed. These are synthetic systems that have biological uh, components in them. And uh, we know that uh, coiled coils have numerous uh, mechanical applications as well. Uh, extensible networks of coiled coils in fibrin, which is found in the, the blood clot, is a nice example uh, where the system can stretch up to 800% strain due to the unfolding processes that I mentioned earlier. So the question was, uh, can unfolding activity be controlled by uh, polymer conjugation? So we carried out constant force simulations where um, you have a helix uh, and uh, uh, two forces attached to the ends of the helix, so it's in tension. And you look at the lifetime of unfolding or the process of unfolding and how long it takes under this applied constant force. And we looked at two systems, one with polymer conjugated uh, helices, the other without polymer conjugation. And we found from these studies that uh, the lifetime of the helices under mechanical insults such as this one is consistently much longer than the uh, systems that don't have poly polymer conjugation. So clearly polymer conjugation extends the lifetime and this was about 20 to 80 percent extension in most of the systems we looked at. Now typically with protein unfolding you have to look at multiple uh, force levels because uh, the mechanisms of unfolding and the energetics of the process depends strongly on the uh, magnitude of the force applied. So uh, in this case, you also see a small force regime and a large force regime, but uh, the observation that the peg stabilizes the um, um, protein uh, remains the same. And this is sort of the first observation that uh, tells us that polymer conjugation can indeed lead to mechanical stabilization as well. Now the question of course is uh, what's the mechanism for this and how can we explain the process and this is still ongoing work but one of the things that uh, again uh, plays a big role we think is the, the aspect of solvent shielding. In particular um, in the central part of the uh, helix where the polymer resides you can see clear differences between um, the likelihood of uh, backbone backbone hydrogen bonding and backbone water hydrogen bonding. So in the process of unfolding, a helix will lose its backbone hydrogen bonds in favor of uh, making new bonds with water that's surrounding the helix. What the peg does is to reduce the likelihood of that uh, bond formation to occur or delay it, thereby allowing the backbone bonds to recover uh, from this unfolding uh, process. So it's essentially um, promoting some kind of refolding uh, process, but we're still investigating this a little bit further. Um, simulations also seem to suggest that from a mechanistic perspective, if you look at the snapshots of unfolding in the lower end, you can clearly see the, the uh, helix unfolding at the tip. Uh, these are the black snapshots at the bottom. And later the, the peg uh, molecules uh, hovering around this uh, local region can lead to the self-healing of the helix to reform uh, some of these bonds. So this is uh, very new uh, uh, findings that uh, really point towards uh, the possibility of using polymer conjugation to reinforce uh, the peptide systems. So moving forward, we're looking at uh, higher degrees of conjugation where you can uh, almost in a brush-like system, uh, you can have polymers attached to the uh, helical assemblies to improve the stabilization effects and also to improve the sideways uh, excluded volume effects that could be used to uh, develop new types of micelles and uh, self-assembling systems. Uh, one can see these uh, mushroom type of domains uh, around the coil-coil systems when you look at it from the top. And you can clearly see that uh, uh, these are almost like uh, density functional regions uh, that you could perhaps plug into some kind of a multi-scale theory um, that would describe uh, not just the, uh, the relative energetics of the systems but uh, the final geometries that would emerge in hierarchical assemblies. And uh, for this purpose, we're now uh, doing a large number of all atomistic simulations that give us the radius of gyration scaling laws, um, density functions of the polyethylene glycol around the proteins, and um, also looking at the stabilization of the, the proteins as a whole. And combining all of this information in sort of a, a field approach or a coarse-grained approach 
we think uh, may allow us to study uh, extremely large assemblies, uh, which would be even challenging with uh, standard uh, coarse grain modeling approaches. So uh, we're understanding all of these effects now, and this is sort of our outlook uh, into the future uh, in this project. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the students uh, that worked on this project. Uh, Luis Ruiz did a lot of the work on uh, uh, polymer peptide nanotubes. Uh, Elizabeth, Elham, and others worked on the uh, coral core systems in particular and uh, made a lot of progress in this area. And uh, almost every other student in the group has uh, contributed some way, one way or another intellectually to this problem. And I'd like to acknowledge the various funding sources uh, for this project uh, as well which uh, enabled uh, a lot of these advances. Uh, with that, I'd like to summarize sort of uh, where we think this is uh, going in terms of uh, both computations and experiments. Uh, I mentioned a couple of grand challenges that we're interested in. One is uh, the idea of combining flux and selectivity in designer uh, peptide nanotube membranes and uh, basically mimicking biological systems uh, and the uh, unique capabilities of you know, aquaporins and ion channels in having uh, very high flux and also very high selectivity against different species. And I think we've made progress in that area, utilizing computations as, a, as an enabling tool. Um, in terms of the peptide polymer conjugates and coil coils, the idea is to blend stability and functionality in uh, new engineered systems where stability comes from the effects of polymers uh, that we can predict, and also functionality comes from uh, the uh, evolutionary principles that we find in biology. And combining these two with the driving force of uh, materials by design and by inspiration, uh, we hope that we can come up with uh, new materials um, that, um, that enables new functionalities. Um, uh, now there's a lot of advances being made with uh, 3D printing and a lot of different technologies that are uh, also breaking new ground in, in terms of how we manufacture things. Uh, at the molecular scale, the idea of self-assembly and how these interfacial forces uh, can be utilized to guide self-assembly towards new three-dimensional microstructures is, I think, uh, the, the frontier of research that's going to be enabling uh, new capabilities with peptides and polymer conjugates. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, I could uh, uh, convey the importance of this field and I'd like to thank you for being uh, here to listen to this talk and if you have any questions I'll be happy to answer them at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much Sinan for such a wonderful uh, Great, great. Thank you. I think there is a, a noise. Uh, So, Ari, your microphone has noise. I have, you can mute yourself, Ari. Uh, otherwise, I will mute you. Thanks. <laughs> nice. I did it. He did it. <laughs> Go ahead. Are to moderate the questions? Yes. Are there any questions from the audience? Well, yes, there are. Right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so uh, I'll, if I could take the, the first one. So see that you did a very good job of focusing on the multi-scale aspects of this. But I, I have sort of a single molecule question for you. In your results on peg stabilization mm -hmm. of, of, of peptides, you, you, you showed some results suggesting that, uh, that solvent shielding was, 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 was central. But what would happen if you just had a peptide plus peg in, in a vacuum? Even in a vacuum, does PEG uh, stabilize uh, stabilize the lifetime, of, the mechanical lifetime of a, salt, of a uh, peptide? Uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, we haven't looked at that actually. But uh, it would be fairly straightforward to do it uh, um, in simulation, at least. Um, typically, we prefer not to do things in vacuum because proteins are not as uh, comfortable being in vacuum in many cases. Um, but uh, I would imagine that there is going to be some interactions between the peg and the surface of the protein that could still uh, contribute to the stabilization. For mechanical, I'm not entirely sure what it would do. Um, probably would change the way the forces get distributed, perhaps, um, something along those lines. But uh, uh, it's a bit early to say, but that's an excellent suggestion, I think. Um, 
I, I'm unfortunately I don't have a good answer for it uh, at this point. Yeah. Gina, can I ask you to show your webcam so people can see you? Oh sure, I thought it was on. I, I can see myself, but uh, <laughs> I'm not projecting. Uh, I think. Is it on now? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, I, I have a couple questions also. Sure. Um, so I was wondering what uh, force field you're using for your polymer and your and your peptides, and then in particular for the, the force field parameters where they're interacting with each other. Uh, what how how are you getting those parameters? Yeah, so we use the charm uh, parameters for both, and uh, the the peg. Uh, I think there were a couple of studies that looked at polyethylene glycol parameterization for charm to make it consistent with the peptide force fields. So mm -hmm. we didn't develop new parameters there. The connection between the two, I think, is a malamide uh, functionality. That was sort of the challenging part, and we used uh, generalized uh, charm uh, force field for that purpose. And we, uh, with generalized charm, you typically have uh, uh, close estimates of the parameters uh, that uh, give you a sense of what the values should be and the typical algorithm gives you a sense of how bad the estimates are uh, for that system. In this case they were reasonably good uh, so it's, we can think of this whole force field as a variant of the charm force field and then the uh, cross interactions emerge naturally from it. Okay. I think as you extend to uh, other kind of polymer systems that's all, I'm sure you recognize this. That's going to be an issue because you know, we're working, for example, just like polymethyl methacrylate, and there aren't charm parameters for for all the functional groups. So we're having to sort of combine PCFF for the polymers with uh, the the force field parameters like charm, and, and then uh, work with trying how they interact together uh, with these two different kind of formatted force fields. So I, I don't know if you've run into these kind of issues yet with some of your other polymers. No, that, that's an excellent suggestion. In the context of peptides, we only looked at polyethylene glycol. Um, for other systems, we look at cellulose and polymer interactions as well. And uh, there it, it can be an issue if you're... Mm -hmm. So we haven't worked too much on that. We usually work on <coughs> things that we had parameters for. And mm -hmm. at some point we use, uh, when you go yeah. to more coarser levels, uh, uh, right. You can think of certain yeah. things as simply surface interactions and uh, coarse grain models for the polymers become yeah. separate yeah. from that. Yeah. But I think that's excellent work and very important as a, as a field of research uh, to come and up then, with these cross interactions. As a, then as a quick follow up, the, uh, the coarse grain model, you're using a charm coarse grain model? Uh, for the uh, polymer peptide conjugates, we developed our own terms uh, okay. based on the charm uh, binding energies. And it's a very simplified model because the, the scales are just immense uh, to study self-assembly. So those are essentially simple Leonard-Jones type of interactions which uh, have free energy uh, terms coming from the estimates from molecular simulations and with some uh, validation from experimental values. So we roughly know the binding energies. Uh, we have a sense of how the polymer conjugation would scale those binding energies. And from that, we can look at growth of those systems uh, in that case. Thank you. So I, Mark has got kicked off, but uh, I've just been in touch with him. And he, he uh, uh, like, that's a question on his behalf. Which is, and this, and this relates to the first part of your talk, where you're discussing, uh, you're discussing specificity of, of these channels. And you really showed that the lumen chemistry is the dominant feature in, 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 uh, in, in specificity. And so, it's, but the, so the, the question, that's on behalf of Marcus, is, is a multi scale question, which is, the, which is uh, going level up, if you have this embedded in a membrane, are, are there mechanical factors that can affect the specificity and, and through, through alterations to channel morphology? That, that, that are there mechanical factors that could come into play over ranges of stress that are, uh, that are accessible in the membrane? So, so is it possible for, for a membrane-delivered stress to alter specificity in, in, a, in a noticeable way without breaking apart a membrane? I believe at reasonable pressure values, you could see changes in the breathing modes of the peptides. 
So these are ring-like structures. So as soon as you apply a certain amount of strain to them, the way they vibrate is going to change. And we know for sure that the fluctuations of these functional groups, not only the nature of the functional group, but also how it fluctuates and how flexible it is, does play a role on the binding energies. Um, that's not something we've looked at yet, how to tune the pressures uh, uh, within the membrane or uh, looking at strain-induced uh, uh, specificity, change, specificity changes in the uh, transport properties, but I think it would play a role. I think it'll be relatively minor to the individual chemistries, uh, such as the nonpolarity and the size of the pores, simply because the, the covalent bonds that make up the ring do not stretch as much. And if anything, you'll change the vibrational frequencies of these uh, major modes of flexibility. So I think it will play a role. How important it is, I would imagine it will be less important than size and a little bit less important than chemistry, but it can still be a way to tune uh, these interactions. Um, with uh, actual biological channels, they do play a big role, uh, mechanical activation, because you can lead to conformational changes in the system. Uh, with simple rings, we don't have that level of sophistication. Um, same with voltage-gated channels, you know, conformational changes play a big role. Uh, so these are very uh, so-called, you know, dumber versions of the actual uh, biological channels in that sense. Thank you, Sina. Hey, Sina, I have a question. Yes, Thanks. So, uh, so going from atom stick to coarse grain, so uh, uh, do, you use a, do you use a top-down? Okay. Or bottom-up uh, approach. Uh, for instance, if so, uh, for instance, uh, are you using solvent-free or uh, uh, in your coarse grain modeling? We use a number of things. So uh, oftentimes, if there's a good model that we can use, like a Martini force field, etc., uh, sometimes we try to get insights from that and compare with atomistic simulations. Um, for simpler systems. Um, so those uh, typically have explicit solvent in them. The methods we developed are typically solvent-free. Um, the methods we've developed for graphene, graphene oxide, and uh, different types of methacrylates uh, are all solvent-free systems, but you could incorporate uh, explicit or implicit effects of solvent in those systems. Regarding your first question, whether we apply a top-down or a bottom-up approach, um, the one Techniques that we have developed for uh, non-biological systems are typically what we call hybrid approaches. So in essence, you look at atomistic structures, uh, probability distribution functions, and also um, for, for polymers, for example, we look at glass transition temperature, uh, moduli, molecular mobility, and many other factors, and we match all of those. On top of that, we compare with experimental data, such as the uh, molecular weight dependence of glass transition which are Flory-Fox constants uh, in those systems, and do further tuning of the system if necessary uh, using experimental data. Some of that is used for purely validation. Other data is used also for calibration. Um, so I think um, strictly bottom-up approaches are very appealing because they don't call for any experiments, but also they are very challenging because if you do it very rigorously, even from a mathematical perspective, oftentimes, when you compare with experiments, uh, the results can be uh, way off. So, uh, you know, rigorous approaches there doesn't always lead to good results, unfortunately, and uh, that's a struggle that we have as well. So kind of a, a hybrid approach, we find it to be very useful for describing a, a number of phenomena, particularly in polymer thin films, that turns out to be a good, uh, good approach. But you know, the issue there is, of course, uh, how rigorous can you be from a mathematical standpoint when you mix and match uh, properties? That's uh, an open question still. Right. All right. With that, we've, we've been on for it's over an hour now, so we should probably cut this off. But uh, Yvonne, would you like to say any final words? Yes. Thank you so much, Sinan, for a great seminar. Thank you for um, your answers, and thank you all for participating. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great pleasure. And thanks everyone. Thanks, Ivan and Congress. Mark and I would both like to thank you for arranging this colloquium series for the Anu Beam Working Group of INAC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.